So I, I think you know part of the uh, unique personal awareness that arises when you're riding your bike has to do with your vulnerability. You know, when you're when you're on a bike, instead of being encased in metal, you're I think a lot more humane. You're vulnerable. You are I think aware that at any moment, you know, someone in a car or a pothole or something, you know, might happen to you. And I that doesn't have to mean you feel fear. I think it just means that you have a heightened awareness of your surroundings. And I think that makes all of your senses, you know, much more alive and acute. So that you're, I find that my sense of smell, my sense of sight, you know, what I'm hearing is all just like much more heightened and, um, and vibrant when I'm on my bike. And that's a wonderful feeling to have, to be, I mean, it almost makes you feel younger in a way, you know, when your senses are so alive like that. What are you doing? What are you experiencing? You're, you're smelling people's cologne or perfume or shampoo. You know, you're checking out, oh, cool shoes. I wonder we got those, nice ass. Or, you know, whatever you, whatever all these human things that we do when we're surrounded with our fellow citizens. So um, if you, you, you don't do that in, in traffic jams in cars, you know, you, you're enclosed, you're cut off from society. You're never interacting with your fellow citizens. So social inclusion is the most important one. You're, you're, you're together, you know, all your senses are activated when you're on a bicycle and that makes you feel like you're a part of the, the fabric of the urban landscape more than any other form of transport. You get a different mental map of your city when you cycle. If you, if you spend your time driving, then you spend your time stuck in traffic jams and probably navigating underground car parks and remembering what letter and what colour car park you've parked on and you're completely disoriented. Likewise, if you live your life in the subway system, you're like popping up in these different parts of the city and you don't how, know how they all connect. Um, none of us have the luxury of flying, but cycling brings us pretty close to it. So when you cycle a city, you've only got to ask bike messengers this. Bike messengers can get from one part of the city to another part of the city in a, in a time that anyone else finds inconceivable. So the cause as a cyclist, you know, you've got all the bridges and the parks and the roads and the footpaths and the shared spaces, and you've got all of it to yourself. You know, you can navigate the whole lot. Um, and move in this way, the whole city gets shrunk to roughly the size of a big building when you're on a bicycle. Red Hook is a neighborhood that I moved to when I first moved to New York six years ago. My uncle ha has a wood shop here, and when I arrived to New York, I just had literally no money, so I lived in his wood shop for a year. And just, you know, I didn't know anyone. The, the neighborhood is really kind of empty. I mean, most people, they might come here like once or twice a year, and that's it, just because it's, you know, they're used to convenience. They're used to being able to get on a subway, get off the subway, and, you know, be where, be where they want to be. There is no convenient public transportation that comes here. It's sort of cut off from the rest of Brooklyn in that sense. But when I ride my bike, I can be in lower Manhattan in 15 minutes. So it's really not far away. But if, you, if you're not mobile on a bicycle, it's, hard, it's a hard neighborhood to get to. There's less people that live here. It's not very dense. You know, the streets aren't crowded. It's quiet at night. You, know, you, you tend to really know your neighbors here.
you know, it's not a trend. It's not like acid wash jeans in the 1980s or white tennis socks in the late, you know, early 90s. It's it's sticking because cities are taking it seriously, you know. And and the bicycle, when it was invented 125 years ago, you know, the transformational effect that it had on society was massive. It liberated the working classes. It liberated women for the first time. It improved the gene pool in rural areas, you know, because the mobility radius was increased. So. Uh, I love that story in, uh, in rural England and, and in the United States as well. So you have your birth, birth records and uh, family names had uh, stayed in the same small areas for, for centuries because you, know, you simply just didn't go to the next village. You know, you, everything happened in, this, in your town or your neighborhood or, you know, your, your region. Um, and then they started seeing these family names starting to appear, you know, in far in distances far away from where they had been for hundreds of years. This is simply because the bicycle made it possible to, to ride you know, 40 kilometers to the next village and find a wife or find a job as well and settle down somewhere else. So the bicycle improve, improved our gene pool uh, as well. So this massive effect on society, it's transformed human society more quickly and more effectively than any other invention in human history. So what I think is happening now is that people are, are trying to, you know, to do that again. They, they, they see the value of the bicycle, not only as transport, and all the blah, 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 health benefits of a cycling population, this is great. Um, and, and reducing congestion and pollution, that's great too. But, but the bicycle is now, once again, a symbol for where we want to go with our cities. Right now we're seeing a whole new generation of Americans you know, reject the suburbs and flock to the city. I think primarily because they have found the suburbs to be boring. There's just not enough going on. Sure, there's plenty of room. Sure, you can drive your car wherever you want, but there's, there's no magic. There's no you know, interaction. There's no friction. There's no um, transaction um, of people. And so there's a reason why a whole generation of young people are moving to New York, you know, to Philadelphia, to you know, other cities around the country. And it's because I think they know that they'll be happier there. Um, because cities give people something that suburbs can't, you know, which is this, you know, rich uh, life of public space. You know, you can walk outside your door and um, meet your neighbor um, and, you know, ride your bike to dinner, um, you know, all of a sudden decide, oh, I think I'll go check out that park. You know, you have options. You know, you have these, like, wonderful options that you don't have in the suburb where everything is isolated and pre-planned. So, the happiness of urban life is something that Americans, I think, are rediscovering right now. And I'm very proud that New York, I think, is, has become somewhat of a beacon for the rest of America um, for a future, hopefully, of vibrant, you know, thriving, you know, healthy urban existence. Um, I think America has been anti-city uh, in, the, in the past. And, you know, cities are these dirty, uh, crime-ridden, uh, ug ugly places. Um, but when cities are at their best, I mean, there's no other form of human settlement that rivals it in terms of, you know, giving people what they need, which is um, sociability and, uh, and uh, just never knowing what's around the corner. I think, you know, my favorite moments in New York City are when I, I'm riding my bike and I don't know where I'm going, you know, where you can just get on your bike or start walking and you don't know where you're going to end up and the city unfolds, unfolds for you um, in ways that you, that you can't possibly know. And um, I think it's that, you know, mysteriousness of, 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 of the city that, uh, that I think many people are attracted to. What, of course, starts creating uh, issues as the claw of bicycles in, uh, in the heart of the Copenhagen. It's, it's not the failure of the, of the bicycle, bicycle, it's, it's the, the success of the bike, bicycle. bicycle. Uh, and you can see also what, what has turned the car into a challenge for cities in terms of congestion and pollution and noise. It's not the failure of the car, but the success of the car that's creating this. And each time you have these situations, they, um, they also sort of remind you of the importance of, of choice and the importance of diversity, that if every, everybody would move with bicycle, it, it wouldn't be ideal either. either. I think it's, it's, it's brilliant, brilliant that each way of moving around has its own preferred uh, mode of transportation.
the future cities do have a problems with the cars. I think that the automobile industry is, is, is a great industry and, and the cars are great for some purposes. But if, if the car was invented today, it wouldn't be allow, allowed inside the city. It's, it's just, it, it's too dangerous. It takes too much space. It's, uh, it's old fashioned. If you want to develop the inner cities, you, you have to use public transportation, have to be better, but, but the bikes, is the cheapest way for a rather poor city to, to have your citizens riding around. Most cities on the planet were not designed for cars, and if they were designed for cars, they were designed badly for cars. We're not going to get rid of the car, and we shouldn't. It still serves a lot of functions in our society, but, you know, do I want 15,000 cars riding past my window here every day, even in Copenhagen? No. They're uh, Italian traffic planners, they call these kind of people parasites. Um, and not even being mean, that's just a, a great word to describe. People who live in the suburbs, who are going to the city center, they're driving past my window and polluting my neighborhood, making my neighborhood unsafe. Um, and, and they have nothing to do here. You know, they're parasites. They're just feeding off the host organism by driving through it. So, you know, restricting cars and their movements in cities simply makes a city nicer, you know, pollution-wise, but also traffic safety and, 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 and all of these things. So um, there will, will still be people who ride, who drive cars. Uh, but, you know, there's just too many of them, and it's, it's just this perception that needs to be changed. Um, you know, get people onto the bikes, but also public transport and whatnot. So, um, I don't want 15,000 cars outside my window, you know. Half would be maybe nice, you know, but none would be great, but of course that's unrealistic. Having come from a city that's with a skyline that is really built from industry and commerce and finance, um, over the last 10 years, the main developments in New York has been about making it a better place to live so that you have, um, you know, the Hudson River Park that replaces the, the, the industrial uh, uh, activities of the piers now actually becomes a park. Uh, you have the High Line, which is an old train line that is now uh, a public park that moves through Chelsea and, uh, and Meatpack. Um, you have the more, more bicycle lanes than, uh, than we now have in Copenhagen. You have a plan to plant a million trees and they've reached like 700 and something thousand. So it's like a, a massive plan to make the city much greener and much more lively. And then of course pedestrianize the uh, uh, Times Square and major parts of Broadway. So all these elements is bringing back uh, a little bit of nature, a little bit of public life, a little bit of freedom into uh, the sort of the more utilitarian city uh, of New York. And I could imagine that in an ideal scenario, in a, in a quite possible future, you would maybe stop thinking about cities as something different from nature. And you would just start seeing cities as another form of landscape that uh, just like you have mountains and you have savannas uh, you also have uh, dense cities like new york but they are, have as many animals and as much green as uh, you would uh, uh, in a in a mountain cascade it's just a different kind of mountain it's a man-made mountain and it has a man-made uh, ecosystem but it is as as natural and as organic as, as anything else so it's not a, a departure from the city, but it's just getting more and more alternatives, more and more diversity into the city. Well, there's the uh, 
often uh, quoted Frank Sinatra lyric of, you know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And I think that's true on a couple different levels with respect to the revolution that's happened here in New York. With respect to other U.S. cities, New York has much narrower streets. So if New York can carve out space, more space for bikers and walkers, you know, any city can do it. And that's precisely what many of the European planners told us when they came here to New York, because in Europe they have even narrower streets, and they came to New York and they said, you have all this room, you know. So um, that's an interesting one. You know, if New York can transform its streets, certainly any U.S. Uh, city can. I think politically, you know, New York is a tremendously difficult place to make progressive change. You know, every time you propose to change just one square inch of asphalt, there's 10 people who rise up and say, tell you why you can't do that, you know, because you're taking space away from the taxis or you're taking, you know, space away from the street vendors if you widen the sidewalk or, uh, you know, create more bike parking, you know. So there's just a lot of different constituencies vying for that limited street space. So if New York can figure out how to make it happen politically, I think other cities that are, frankly, much less contentious than New York can be um, will hopefully find it like an easier time. And if you look at what San Francisco and Chicago are now doing you know, to reclaim you know, their public realm, in many ways, similar to how New York has pioneered you know, changing parking into biking or taking car lanes and turning them into you know, bike lanes or bus lanes, they're finding uh, the same benefits, and I think with maybe not as much political contention. When we ask uh, this, the Copenhageners why they uh, choose a bike, uh, they choose it because it's fast and convenient and easy. Uh, a very few of them are choosing it because of the environment. So the awareness of choosing the bike and environment isn't that big here in Copenhagen. And um, I'm not sure that it necessarily has to be that. Um, I think it's better to make um, the biking, the fastest and easiest way to get from A to B, than to require that the citizens should think about the environment every day. If you make the bicycle the quickest way from A to B in a city, any city on the planet, people will ride. You don't even have to sell it. You know, if, if people find out there's a quicker way from A to B, they will do it. Um, that's why people ride bicycles in Copenhagen. Um, Paris, you know, is now a relatively bicycle friendly because of their bike share program. And we saw that as well. Who went over to the bicycle as soon as it appeared in, uh, in Paris in, you know, what, four years ago, five years ago? Uh, it was the metro users, right? They came off the metro and onto the bikes because the metro was the quickest A to B. And then there was something quicker, boom. And that's what people do. But that presupposes infrastructure. You need safe, separated infrastructure on the busy streets like we have in, in Copenhagen and, and cities in the Netherlands. Uh, that will get people to ride. That's the key, really, to everything. Um, a lot of it, also, you know, another idea is also marketing. If you start selling this properly um, in, in emerging bicycle cities who have forgotten the role of the bicycle, you, you, you still need to sort of push people, push some buttons, and get people to accept the fact that you know, riding a bicycle is not associated with being poor. Um, you know, it is actually quite a cool thing, and that's what we're doing with Cycle Chic and, and all of this is sort of, you know, it's changing the status and the perception of the bicycle. So, and the, the third thing is really, um, is, is uh, taming what we call the bull in society's china shop or the elephant in the china shop in, in other cultures. But 
You know, if we, if right now we're ignoring the bull, there's this big bull that we've let into our china shop, it's smashing everything. And instead of confronting the bull, we're turning around and, uh, and, and bubble wrapping our pedestrians and our, and our cyclists and scolding them for, you know, getting in the way of the bull. But instead we should turn around and face the bull, medicate it, castrate it, tame it, uh, tie it up, right? And uh, this is the automobile and, and um, some cities are doing that in Europe. Uh, most cities outside of Europe are not. Uh, the car rules the streets, you know, um, and, and traffic calming measures are really hard to implement in many cities. And, and, and that's the key to any livable city and any bicycle culture is to tame the automobile, to restrict its movements, to slow it down, lower speed limits and whatnot. So um, these, this is the three things we need to do in order to create not just a bicycle friendly city, but a livable city, a nice place to live. The neighborhood has really embraced the race. For the first couple years, I wasn't able to promote it heavily in the neighborhood just because I was doing it without permission. And you know, it's, it's easier to ask for forgiveness and permission. So I just kind of, you know, made it happen. And then people from the neighborhood would hear about it and come out. But this year, the fact that we were, from the very beginning, we had permits and we had permission, we really got the neighborhood involved. We, we, we solicited local sponsors. We got a lot of, lot of support. Um, we organized a Made in Red Hook pop-up store at the race, so local artists and artisans and shops had goods for sale at the race. New York is often called a city of neighborhoods. I mean, there are literally hundreds of separate neighborhoods all throughout the city. And people in New York, I think, feel a lot of pride that they live in a particular neighborhood, you know, whether it's Bedford-Stuyvesant or, you know, Murray Hill um, or Douglaston or wherever. And when you go to these different neighborhoods on the subway, you know, you go underground and you come up and, okay, I'm in, I'm in a different neighborhood. And so you think that New York is still this separate city of all of these hundreds of different neighborhoods. When you're riding your bike, you are literally knitting together all of these separate neighborhoods in, into one unified entity. And when I look at what happens when there's a bike lane that goes from one neighborhood to the other, and maybe the neighborhoods are even very different, but there's still this protected bike lane or this beautiful public space that can connect them, you see the diversity of New York become even greater because the diversity is, is mingling, um, you know, different neighborhoods I think are coming together. So bicycling is at its best and here in New York when it is providing, I think, this knitting together of our disparate neighborhoods. Um, so in that way, I think it's a very inclusionary and integrating force um, for a city. And that, I think, can what, you know, that can hold the city together. New York's richness is, you know, obviously it's ethnic diversity and I think you will always have neighborhoods that are more one way than another. But what safe bike lanes and people friendly streets do is create this opportunity for people to meet each other in public space as equals, as citizens of the same city. Um, and even if you're not talking to each other necessarily, just becoming familiar with each other and trading a little glance or seeing that, hey, that dad has a child who's my age as well and we have some some commonality and so I, I think it's that interaction in public space that provides you know the basis you know for a healthy city for a healthy democracy where we can meet as equals in public space 
and you know, bike lanes and wide sidewalks and people-friendly streets are that platform um, where we can um, all meet and mingle and I think you know, create a healthier uh, urban democracy. We get interested delegations from all over the world. I hope they all are getting inspired by visiting us. But the main, it's so important that they are starting there where they are. Um, so I think if you're a city with not many, many bike riders and you're re really starting a scratch, scratch, make it simple. Take, take the cheap solutions, um, make a complete route mate, uh, make it very cheap and make it Better take a, a little square of the town, a little area, and make this complete in a cheap way. And then you can go on when you have improved the politicians and the inhabitants that this isn't a good investment. It's by far the, the biggest event every year in Red Hook. Um, this year we had over 4,000 people come. And all those people, they just fill up all the bars and restaurants and shops. You know, so from an economic value, the, the business really increases that weekend. From a, an awareness standpoint, the Red Hook, you know, we use Red Hook in the name of the race. And that it's the name of the neighborhood. All of our branding has the kind of the, the signature Red Hook graphic on it. So, you know, internationally, as this race grows, people are becoming aware of Red Hook as a, as a neighborhood and it, it is starting to promote tourism. Quite often, when if people get fanatic about bicycles, then it's all about bicycles, and then they hate the car. But then, when they have to uh, take the car, they'll take the car. So, um, so I think the the true message is that a successful city is a city that has space for everybody, like all kinds of people, all kinds of cultures, all kinds of careers, uh, and uh, all kinds of ways of moving around. You know, there's a tendency for especially cyclists, I think, to see I'm a cyclist and you're a driver and you're a pedestrian and getting into this identity politics of getting around. One thing that you realize if you look at the actual data of how New Yorkers get around, you know, the course of a day, the average New Yorker is taking the subway, taking the bus, taking a cab, you know, maybe driving a little bit, certainly walking everywhere and maybe hopping on a bike every once in a while. So. What we're seeing now with bicycling becoming more mainstream is that it's becoming more of this identity of, I take all modes of transportation depending on what makes sense for that particular trip. So I think that's the place where we want to be with bicycling, you know, in the next few years, where it stops becoming this like really special identity thing and starts becoming something that, that, everybody, that everybody enjoys, everybody does, um, maybe as routine as taking the subway, but will still be much more fun.